Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and, um, and welcome to PNP Live. Uh, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. We have a very engaging program for you this evening, featuring a distinguished former public official, Robert Zellick, talking about his new book, uh, America in the World, in conversation with another very accomplished individual, Philip Zellico. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. Uh, to post a question at any point during the, uh, during the talk, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of America in the World. Now, Bob Zellick, as uh, many of you know, held a number of high-level government assignments under both Bushes, spanning foreign policy, trade, and international finance. Among them, U.S. Trade Representative and Deputy Secretary of State, and he headed the World Bank for five years. Through it all, Bob gained a reputation for the wise exercise of pragmatism in the practice of statecraft. The past decade, he's been a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And he served on various boards and as a senior counselor at Brunswick Geopolitical, an advisory service of uh, Brunswick Group. His book, uh, America in the World, uh, came out last fall, but it remains uh, very relevant and, and, and very much worth reading. It offers a wide ranging and insightful account of 200 years of US diplomacy and foreign policy. Although it's not so much a history as it is a, a volume of uh, narrated uh, stories uh, illustrating Bob's core themes or traditions for understanding US foreign policy. And those include the, the need for US dominance in North America, the importance of trade and technology to national security and the economy, the value of alliances, the influence of public opinion and Congress on policymaking, and a recognition of America's purpose or special leadership role in the world. This is a book that will appeal to, to scholars uh, and general readers alike. A review in the Washington Post called it both momentous and readable, literate and witty. And Foreign Affairs said it combines a practitioner's wisdom with scholarly research and deep knowledge of how Washington works. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Bob will be in conversation this evening with Phil Zellico, uh, who has had uh, several successful careers as an attorney, a diplomat, and an academic. Uh, he's worked uh, on international or national security policy in five administrations, from Reagan to Obama. And among the uh, governmental projects he's most known for is his time as executive director of the 9-11 Commission. His association with the University of Virginia where he's a professor of history and of governance goes back more than 20 years. He's also the author most recently of The Road Less Traveled, which tells the fascinating story of a failed effort involving Woodrow Wilson to negotiate an early end to World War I. So uh, Bob and Phil, the screen is yours. Thanks very much. And uh, it's uh, great to rejoin the politics and prose audience and have a chance to talk with my good friend, Bob Zellick. Um, Bob, um, you've taken on here this immense task. Like, uh, okay, I'm gonna write a history of American foreign policy in one book. This is a, a and, and I think, to many people, this would have come as a bit of a surprise. Um, yes, the famous policymaker, president of the World Bank, writer about trade and international economics. Um, but here you are not only going into a role as a historian, but taking on this magisterial task. So would you mind explaining to some of our viewers why you, why you chose to uh, um, step into a phone book, put on a cape, and try to write this book? Well, thanks, Phil, for, for uh, moderating this uh, event, and thanks to Brad and Politics and Prose and all the audience for tuning in. So uh, I'll start with a little bit what you and Brad also alluded to is to give a sense of what, what the book's about. Um, I tell the stories of how leading Americans sought to address the foreign policy problems of their eras over some 200 years from, from Ben Franklin to uh, George H.W. Bush in 1989 and 92. 
So I'm focusing on people and particular episodes. So, so stories do capture it because I wanna highlight the practical problem solving uh, work of diplomacy. And then I add my assessments based on experience and insights about the conduct of diplomacy. Along the way, I try to draw out some of the ideas that have contributed to the pluralism of American diplomacy over 200 years. And I try to identify uh, five traditions. Um, I had a seminar up at Harvard of faculty and graduate students, and they said, look, you can't end with Bush 41. So I also added an afterword where I briefly examined the Clinton, uh, George W. Bush, Obama, and a bit of Trump through the lens of the five traditions. So in essence, the book is a, is a multiple biography for people that like biographies. As for why I wrote it, it really stems from the government experience. Because when I was in government, as you know, Phil, I often drew upon history as I thought about problems. And I wanted to encourage others, uh, especially the next generation to do so. So as a professor, you know that many foreign policy courses focus on international relations theories. And they're fun to debate and joust, uh, but I found them of limited use when I was dealing with issues such as German unification or trade strategy or China policy or Darfur Sudan or World Bank and development. And instead, I saw how people focused on the practical problem solving nature. Now this audience is probably well aware, Henry Kissinger wrote a book in the 90s titled Diplomacy, where he used history to talk about foreign policy. But not surprisingly, that book reflects the real politic perspective. And so frankly, for a number of decades, I was thinking, how might I try to do something that focuses on uh, American experience and ideas? And I suppose one other dimension was that in those various jobs that you, you mentioned over a number of administrations, I often had younger colleagues and um, to be frank, I didn't know how much they knew about history, so I would ask them, and, and uh, I suppose I used to torture them a bit about with historical questions. And I discovered that insofar as they had learned history, it tended to be from post-World War II on. And this book, as you know, uh, focuses a lot not only on the 19th century, but some of the interesting periods in the interwar period and, and other topics, as well as uh, the post-World War II and Cold War period. And I, one of the things I've been encouraged by is that from some of your peers who've used the book in universities, I've been encouraged that some of the students like the problem solving nature. And it offers, in a sense, the idea that history can offer insights on how to do better as opposed to the timeless obstacles. So um, listen to this, uh, a few of the takeaways from, from, from that answer. And let me just let me follow up and make sure that I have this right is, here you are, you're a, actual, you're a actual practitioner. But I think in practice, you actually found that rather than relying on international relations theory to help explain and understand what you were doing, you uh, found yourself consistently falling back on and drawing on history. Then um, second, you also found that, you know, as you relied more and more on history, uh, you noticed that a lot of the people you were working with, including a lot of the younger people you were working with, didn't really have a very good understanding of this history. Um, next, that, um, that actually America has a distinctive diplomatic tradition that's quite different from a European diplomatic tradition that someone like Kissinger draws on. And then, but uh, maybe one of the most striking takeaways is in the way you read history. And I want to be sure... What I hear you saying is that one of the things that fascinates you about the history is you're looking to the history, not so much for grand themes about US hegemony or empire or this or that, but you're looking for the history basically as stories of how people grappled with problems, which therefore, you know, relatable to you because you are grappling with problems. But then um, the, one of the, um, challenges that your method and, uh, and your interest seems to bring for this book is uh, too many problems. <laughs> there, if you're gonna cover the whole scope of US history and uh, US foreign relations in one book, um, you have to have some sort of limiting factor here. You just can't describe all the problems and all the stories unless you wanna write you know, an 1100 page or 2000 page time. 
So you had to come up with some sort of limiting device. And the device that you came up with is, okay, I'm gonna pick particular people working on particular problems that you found compelling. But then that forces that forced you to make selections. Could you talk a little bit then about um, why you uh, what sort of people and problems you zeroed in on and why you chose them? Yeah, no, that's an excellent prism to look at this. So um, number one, I wanted to focus on different types of diplomatic problems. There's some sort of mediation, there's some negotiation, there's uh, purchasing of, of, of Louisiana, there's advocacy, there's work with Congress. Um, I also tried to deal with various regions of the world. Um, I you know, it, it, it tend to focus most on uh, North America, Europe, uh, Asia, not as much on, on the Middle East, but I try to draw in some of the connections. Um, I wanna cover different time periods over 200 years. So uh, just to draw one connection, um, when former Secretary of Defense Mattis was making a presentation at one point, he was talking about how he had to recognize that the United States no longer had total domain dominance. And it made me reflect that in much of our history, we didn't have total domain dominance. So whether it's Ben Franklin in the revolution or John Hay at the time of the open door, one of the challenges is, is how do you conduct diplomacy when you're playing a weaker hand, <laughs> which is something that's, that's useful to know. Um, I also wanted to talk about some of the various ideas in the portfolio of American foreign policy. So this is to, to play off the Kissinger real politic. That's one strain. Um, but I think there's a pluralism in the American experience and in a sense of portfolio of ideas for, for future generations to draw from. I felt I needed to cover certain um, people and events just because they were so important. Um, but I also added some non-traditional figures. So for example, I have a chapter on Van Ever Bush, wouldn't show up in most foreign policy books, but I think he's the godfather of science and technology policy, which I think is important in dealing with China, dealing with environmental issues and others. And going back to this discussion with some of my younger colleagues, I think there's some wonderfully innovative, pragmatic statespeople over the years that have been a little bit lost to the mists of time. And I wanted to bring some of them back. Charles Evans Hughes is one of my favorite. But so to give people a little flavor of this, um, after discussing Ben Franklin in the introduction and the uh, negotiation of our independence, my first chapter is on Alexander Hamilton, who of course is a secretary of the treasury, not a secretary of state, because I wanted to introduce the idea of economic statecraft. For the Louisiana Purchase, I dig into the question of, was Thomas Jefferson lucky or was he good or maybe some combination? Um, this audience, of course, will have read many books on the US Civil War, battles and generals and slavery and social effects, but there's very few on the foreign policy of American Civil War. And there was a critical question of how Lincoln and Secretary of State Seward uh, thwarted intervention by Great Britain and France, which really could have changed the course of history. It was a real danger a couple of times. And it's really a question of brinksmanship, how they conducted that policy, while also in a pragmatic sense, uh, avoiding sort of having one war at a time, was Lincoln's phrase. Also, interestingly, the, they're starting to use public diplomacy, as Franklin actually did in terms of influencing attitudes in Britain. Um, with Teddy Roosevelt, who many people will associate with San Juan Hill or, or the Great White Fleet, um, I recall that he was the first American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was for mediation of the Russo-Japanese War and the first Moroccan crisis. This was 1904-05 and 05-06. And I, I talk about the skill of mediation, but also how it fit his larger purpose of maintaining the balance of power. So it, this, with Wilson and, and Roosevelt, the United States is starting to be a figure of power on the world scene. Roosevelt is worried that these crises could risk a conflagration among great powers, which of course happens, as, as you know well, you know, within a decade uh, in another peripheral area, sort of the Balkans that spreads to World War I. Um, after Wilson's failure with the Versailles Treaty, I recall how Charles Evans Hughes really a hundred years ago <laughs> this year um, negotiated naval arms control, but related it to regional security. 
And as you know, sort of many, many critics of arms control sort of see this as a failed effort. I think it's important to see it in the context of the time and understand how arms control needs to be connected with the regional environment, in his case, Northeast Asia. And that has a relevance today. If you think about policy towards North Korea, nuclear weapons, I think you'd have to consider that in a regional context. It has a reference with Iran. I mentioned Van Ever Bush and I, as the godfather of science and technology policy. And then I have some chapters on more recent times. So with John F. Kennedy, it's how he was a crisis manager. Uh, you've written on this subject and the connection of the Berlin and, and, uh, and, and Cuba crisis. With LBJ in Vietnam, this is obviously territory that's been very well mined. So I focus on the late 1964, early 1965 decision to really take over the ground forces. And in this one, drawing on the work of scholars of, such as Fred Logoval, I really apply more of my decision, my policy experience and say, sort of what went wrong? What are the factors that you could examine in this? And as I reflected on it, these factors might also be applicable for other issues, such as the, the, the war with Iraq as you uh, enter into it. Um, and then with Nixon and Kissinger, it's the question of, of China and real politic um, and in overcoming the sense the, the defeat of, of Vietnam. And of course, this fits in today's discussions about great power paradigms. With, with Ronald Reagan, I think historians struggle to understand Reagan even to today. I focused on his use of speeches and how they reflected as an autodidact, how he thought through a strategic issue, but then also combined it with a partner that helped with negotiations. So I worked for many years for James Baker. Baker helped on this on the economic side. George Schultz was critical on the foreign policy side. And then with Bush 41, I focus on the particular skill of alliance leadership, which has always been important for the United States. And if you think about you know, President Biden's challenges today, it's now how are we going to uh, perhaps revive some of that capacity in a different era? So let me uh, ask this question just as a follow up. Um, coming out of this story, do you have any candidates that you want to, uh, for the audience of, uh, figures in the history of American foreign relations who are most neglected or most misunderstood? Well, as I'm sure as a historian, you encountered this. I, I tend to find something in most of these figures that are sort of intriguing. Um, I think um, Lincoln is such a wonderful figure and very few people think about Lincoln as a foreign policy president. And so what I try to tell in that story was, you know, in, in 1861, we almost go to war, we're an incident with Britain where the US Navy, a captain has, has taken some Confederate commissioners off a British ship. And it, it also, I try to give readers an insight of how this works in reality. The, 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 Brit, the Britain was really almost ready for a fight. They're about ready to send a demand to the United States. And, in his dying days, literally dying days, Prince Albert adjusts the note a little bit just to sort of help uh, it go down better with the Americans. And it's quite critical. Seward sort of recognizes this. But then Seward is a good lawyer and he comes up with a wonderful argument on how uh, conceding to the British position is really defending the American position against impressment from, from uh, the War of 1812. So it's creative sort of lawyering. Um, there's another application there in 1862 where if people think about humanitarian crises today. The Civil War to many Europeans looked like a terrible humanitarian crisis. And maybe they should intervene to stop this terrible bloodletting. And what was critical at that point was that the US was signaling that Europeans who did that would pay a price. It was the brinksmanship. And how Lincoln uses the Emancipation Proclamation, of course, to shift from a war over union to war over slavery. But what's intriguing is the first British reaction to the Emancipation Proclamation in the establishment is quite hostile because their mindset is the Indian rebellion or they would call it Indian Mutiny of 1857 and encouraging the uprising of people it doesn't look so good to London. But Lincoln and Seward are quite skillful in then 
using public diplomacy to reach out to the working men of Manchester and others sort of to change the nature of the debate. And then the other one, which I've alluded to is Charles Evans Hughes. Charles Evans Hughes, if, if you reflect upon it as a policymaker, whoa, is he handed this terrible sort of situation. At the time of his confirmation, the senator of his own party says, it doesn't matter who's secretary of state, the Senate's gonna run everything. And so I explain how he takes the circumstances of the time, the politics, Congress, and, and really devises his own diplomatic momentum to create this agreement. That's quite, quite adroitly. So you know, there are different figures. Uh, obviously, uh, LBJ uh, is one that is, uh, is, comes out as a tragic figure. But even in, in analyzing him, I think I try to show partly how his experience as a majority leader led to some of his problems as a president decision maker. And you, you've done work on this, but one of the impressive things about John F. Kennedy was he did learn. And after the, the, uh, the Bay of Pigs, he has this meeting with Eisenhower, where Eisenhower, of course, backs this young president, but then says privately, did you get all your advisors in front of you before you decided this to argue it out so you could kind of decide and keep yourself in a position to, to make the final judgment? And John F. Kennedy learns from that. And as you know, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uses his brother and others to sort of keep options going on the table. Uh, LBJ never does that. LBJ is trying to put together a legislative coalition <laughs> and, and a lot of what his policy is the negotiation of it. So part of the richness that I found in the history was you know, for people who would really want to understand what goes on in diplomacy or foreign policy, or frankly, for younger practitioners, there's a lot to learn here about negotiations and uh, putting together coalitions. And uh, in some cases with John F. Kennedy, not negotiating with yourself as he started to do in, in 1962 with the Soviets on, on Germany. So when I've taught, I've used this book actually in teaching my students. And I think for a lot of them, uh, Charles Evans Hughes is just a complete revelation. I mean, there are like, I don't know, uh, you, of course, there are uh, people in America who know about Charles Evans Hughes as a world builder, but there are only three of them left alive in the United States of America. So, um, you know, the image that everyone has is that there's Wilson, there's a League of Nations cock up, there's a Versailles system, then you have the interwar era and Hitler and boom. The whole story of this basically take on top of the Versailles mess Hughes coming in and building a whole system, including a system for East Asia that most American, my students didn't even know existed, um, and does that in the early 1920s. That's a whole episode, and that completely complicates the story of America in the interwar period, and about which, as I say, I think there are three people still alive who know the story, um, and, and they are now aging and wearing masks. <laughs> So, um, it's like Schleswig Holstein, where there were supposed to be three people that knew it. One went mad, one died, and uh, the other, and the third was Palmerston, who forgot. But uh, the, uh, but again, just for this audience, you know, Charles Evans Hughes almost became president in 1916. He he just loses California by a few thousand votes, and there's an interesting story about how he conducted that campaign. He becomes a very significant. Uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and ends up being talk about the critical area about the New Deal and and kind of how he navigated some of the sensitivities about the the New Deal court with with FDR. So this is a very significant figure. And just to draw out one small example that many people will not even have, have thought about is that, you know, after the United States rejects the Versailles Treaty, we're still at war with Germany. How, how does one deal with that? And he, as a very good lawyer, comes up with the idea of saying, well, let's take the parts of the Versailles Treaty that relate to us. Let's take a congressional or a Senate resolution. Let's put those together and make that a treaty for Germany. And oh, there we go. You know? So these are the practical aspects that when I sometimes find people who like to talk about grand strategy, the theories, it's a little disconnected from my personal experience. So uh, now one person everyone thinks they've heard about is Theodore Roosevelt, to pick another example. And, and everyone has the image in their head 
which is not far from the Robin Williams character in the Night at the Museum movies. <laughs> um, you know, of uh, the bellicose, charging, blustering Theodore Roosevelt. And of course, all, you know, who's famous for speak softly and carry a big stick. And all really they know about is associating Roosevelt with the big stick. And the whole point of your chapter on Roosevelt in a way is about the speak softly part. And that in fact, you know, he's, he's not the president famous for leading America into war. He's actually uh, so paradoxically seems to be a president who uh, acquires a great reputation for helping people avoid war. So, uh, but I think what fascinated you about that too was how he went about solving those problems. Yeah, so obviously this, this, this relates in a way to uh, your wonderful recent book about the road less traveled because let's take Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt together. Uh, so the United States is now a world power but it's trying to understand its domestic political support, how it's gonna play this sort of role internationally. Our foreign service is, is sort of in its rudimentary stage. Um, and so you don't really have the Rogers Act, which creates the formal foreign service till some 1924, Charles Evans Hughes again, by the way. Um, and so uh, what Roosevelt does quite skillfully is that he puts together a network of diplomats from other countries. He gets the, the French and the German ambassadors uh, in Washington, and they, they it's, it's almost early alliance diplomacy. They wanna be part of the game with this activist sort of intelligent sort of leader. He gets uh, one of his groomsmen who is a, a British diplomat in St. Petersburg. He's working them quite effectively. He moves an American diplomat to St. Petersburg, quite skillful, that plays a key role with the czar. And then he, he, from the very start, he's been a little careful until he gets reelected in 1904. But as the Japanese start to reach out to him as a possible sort of mediator, he, he's starting to sensitize them to what sort of needs to be done. And, but he also makes sure that he's got some leverage in the process if he's gonna play this mediation role. And so he, he, he's trying to bring the Russians into the mediation and he's already got the Japanese agreeing to it, but he doesn't tell the Russians that. He says to the Russians, well, maybe I can bring the Japanese along if we do these various things. And so it's a wonderful example about persistence, ideas, different parties together. The first Moroccan crisis, which anybody will remember, is, is, a, is a, even equally fascinating because by this time, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm has got this great respect for, for Teddy Roosevelt. And there's, this is the crisis that almost leads to war between France and Germany in 1905, 1906. It's a question of whether Britain will, will back France. It's a question about uh, sort of position in Morocco. And the German ambassador to the United States, I think it was Steinberg, um, is, is uh, basically so eager to bring Roosevelt in that he communicates to Roosevelt look, if you mediate this and we don't have an agreement, the, the Kaiser agrees that we'll go with what you say. Now, the ambassador actually overread his instructions. That's not what he was permitted to say. But Roosevelt is no fool. He pockets this, he uses this. And at a critical point in the mediation, he says to the, the to Berlin, look, um, if you won't agree with this, I'll have to be go public and explain all of what happened and you'll have to bear the price of it and uh, sort of reversing your position. So it's, it's using power and leverage, but in a diplomatic form. And I think this is particularly important because in much of the American debate, as you know, Phil, it's always a question of military power or not. And I'm trying to bring in sort of economic, different types of leverage, balance of power ideas. And of course, some of the principles that are sort of the core of the United States. And in contrast, I'll be very brief on this because it's what your book discusses, Woodrow Wilson can't do this. It, it, Woodrow Wilson, in, in my experience, is pretty good on tactics. He's pretty good on vision. He's missing what I call the operational art, how you put the pieces together. And that's what your story is about. No, and, and does so facing an opportunity uh, monumentally larger than anything that Roosevelt had the opportunity to work on, uh, perhaps the greatest diplomatic opportunity in modern history. And, uh, but I wanna come back to um, your, uh, your point about the military emphasis 
in the way people think about power. And the point you made earlier, a few minutes ago, where you quoted Jim Mattis, like, you know, domain dominance, this attitude's kind of like um, Americans have become habituated to thinking in these muscular terms about power. And this is in a way why your book is so timely, or it seems so timely to me, is now people are saying, well, we're not so powerful. That uh, is, we can't just kind of make the world dance on a string. And we obviously have to live by our wits the way everybody else does and actually use diplomacy <laughs> and craft. But your point then in the book is, you know what, that's most of American history. And that's kind of the tradition you're trying to revive. And following on that, you then say, actually, there are some distinctive themes that recur again and again, if you think about the long history of the American diplomatic tradition. And I was wondering if you could kind of develop a little bit what you think those major recurrent themes are because they all seem quite relevant in 2021. So d just to follow up directly on your point about diplomacy, I, I start with Ben Franklin because if there ever were a period where the United States was playing a weak hand, <laughs> it was at, at the start of the revolution. And Franklin is a genius about sort of playing Britain off one another with France. He's getting the French to finance us. Uh, and and uh, at the same time, he invents the field of public diplomacy. Nobody knows the United States, but everybody knows Ben Franklin. So that's one interesting example. John Hay also is a good example of this, sort of at the turn of the 20th century. And one view, the traditional canon view is, well, you know, this, this is all poppycock. We're just, because we're not willing to back it with real power. And then from uh, the William Appleton or Williams, it's sort of American economic imperialism. John Hay is very forthright. He said, look, what I'm trying to do is to you know, find the areas of overlap of cooperation, build on it slightly, and hold it together with the weak gravity of, of, of cooperation. He's not trying to overstate it, but that becomes quite important with principles such as the sovereignty of China or whether it's broken up like Africa or our economic relations with China and others, and which end up influencing American policy. But as you said, I, while relaying stories, I wanted to try to add some cohesion. So I drew together five traditions. The first one uh, is the importance of North America. And again, as you know, you go on foreign policy websites of most institutions and we've got Atlantic policy, Pacific policy, India, Middle East, even Africa and Latin America, almost never North America. But of course it was critical in the 19th and 20th century I found this quote from Ronald Reagan, which in 1979, that's quite endearing. He, he's launching his presidential campaign. And he says, you know, it's time that we sort of think about making Mexico and, and Canada stronger and that it's time we stop thinking about our nearest neighbors as foreigners. Well, that's a little different than the rhetoric <laughs> over the past few years. But at heart, what he's talking about is recognizing what the public talks about today. If you ask about foreign policy, It'll be questions of immigration. It'll be questions of environmental issues. It'll be questions of narcotics and organized crime. It's economic integration. That's what North American policy is about. But what I would add to it is we need to see North America as a continental base for our projection of influence globally. And insofar as we have 500 million people, three democracies, integrated economics, better demographics than the rest of the world, see people as human capital as a possibility will be more influential in other parts of the world. Um, and that's, if you think about the newspaper today, those are the issues that, that are gonna confront the Biden administration. Um, the second, trade technology and transnationalism. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that from 1776 on, when John Adams comes up with the model treaty of the United States, it's basically a trade agreement. And so from the very start of the United States, trade was more than a matter of economic efficiency. It's how we connected with the world. And note, this is an era of, of empires and mercantilism. So the basic principle is prying open the system for private actors. And of course, in much of American history, these private actors may be merchants, they may be missionaries, today they may be environmentalists and civil society. And of course, there's the technology uh, dimensions. I use Cordell Hull 
to draw this out too. Another person in the interwar period to talk about the, the free the trade agenda. The third on alliances is important, I think, to understand the first 150 years of American history because with George Washington's caution about entangling alliances and, and or permanent alliances and Jefferson's about entangling alliances, you can see that American leaders in general are trying to avoid alliances, which they associate with the old European diplomacy and politics. So a lot of what I'm talking about international law, sort of the Union and Confederation, the arms control, these are all efforts to engage the world without using traditional alliance structures. But then as you know well, in 1947-49, there's a very distinctive turn. I try to explain why this was not a bit planned grad strategy, but it flowed from a series uh, of events at the time. And the United States invites, in, invents a new type of alliance system. And so what, the later chapters in the book are about how do leaders manage and, and guide that alliance leadership system? How do they adapt it over time? And obviously that's an issue for today. The fourth one is the importance of Congress and public support. And again, this is an area that traditional foreign policy studies often uh, ignore. If you look at Kennan's writings, you can see why they never wanted to let him close to the Congress of the Hill because he's insulting them all the time. And I use Senator Vandenberg in the 47, 49 chapter as a wonderful example in quite detail how he uses the Senate process to be supportive, but it really runs throughout the book. I have Ben Franklin with the Congress. I have how Thomas Jefferson uses the Congress and others. And so uh, today, you know, or more recent years is be people like McCain or, or, or Luger or Nunn or others. And you could ask, well, who will step into that role today? And then the fifth, finally, is uh, America's purpose. I am consciously avoid the term exceptionalism uh, because that, that runs against uh, a lot of people who think they're exceptional as well. But the best way I can explain this is for people who still carry wallets, someday take out a dollar bill and look on the back and you may never have given much attention to what is the great seal of the United States. And on the reverse of that seal, you see this unfinished pyramid. And notice, it's unfinished, and there's an eye of providence above it, and below it, novus order secorum, new order of the ages. So from the very start, these states people were thinking about sort of bigger ideas for the United States, and it's my argument that the purpose evolves. So at first, it's to simply preserve a republic and a world of empires. Then it's the question of the union and notions of confederation. By the time of, of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, it's kind of a rising world power. Um, for, for Wilson, of course, it's to make the world safe for democracy, not to make them in democracies, make it safe for democracy. Um, for Roosevelt, it's the four freedoms. Um, for in the Cold War, it's the leader of the free world. For Bill Clinton, it's the indispensable power. And I think there's three components that go into this. One, of course, the international context in which we operate. Second, you have to maintain public support. And third, some notion of a larger purpose, whether it's small r republicanism, whether it's human rights, whether it's sort of making a, a better world, that is an aspect of the American foreign policy character. And so what I do in the afterward is I use those actually five traditions and, and examine the more recent presence. And readers can do that today too. So what I'd like to do now at this point is, um is bring in some of the questions from the viewers that they've been asking. And uh, we've got some good ones. And I want to start with the lead one, um, which is uh, what, uh, this is on the subject of the Foreign Service. The question is, what is your opinion on the future of the Foreign Service in the implementation of U.S. foreign policy? I, uh, I, I used to be a Foreign Service officer and, I, and you have worked and, uh, and uh, elevated and abused many of the Foreign Service officer. <laughs> so, so what's your view on this? Well, going back to the history, as we mentioned, the 1924 and the Rogers Act is very important to start to professionalize the Foreign Service. I, I think I would expand it to the Foreign Service and many career officials, not only the civil service uh, at the State Department, but if we start to think about the intelligence community, the economic civil servants and others, 
And I think one of the challenges for the Foreign Service and the larger community is how do you, how do you integrate this professionalism? And so, as you know, uh, as a career Foreign Service officer and being posted abroad, the embassies now will have half their staff being people from USDA or commerce or other uh, aspects. And so if we're gonna have an effective foreign policy, you need to have foreign service officers um, who can play that role of connecting aspects of the network. And, and to be more specific, I, I, in my career, I worked on economics, security, you know, scientific issues. I think the challenge for today's foreign service will be able to combine uh, outreach to specialized knowledge, carbon and climate, uh, pandemic and biological securities with the political and institutional structure and, and understand how to get things done. So in some ways, one reason that I hope that uh, the Foreign Service Institute or others sort of encourage younger foreign service officers to read this book is part of my story is the pragmatism of how you need to understand how institutions work, processes work, power work, and bring the substance in to accomplish things. And I think that's where the modern foreign service will, will most add value in working uh, with their, their politically appointed colleagues. So another question um, we have is, uh, which I, I like, also way, like training, to bring up. This is a key aspect of training. So, and, and ongoing training. I think this is one of the things that the State Department will need to enrich itself. As you know, military officers will have staff schools. They will have additional ac uh, aspects of training at different points of their career. We need to have the resources and, and sort of aptitude approach to do this for the Foreign Service. So another question we, we asked that was asked, which I also like is, <laughs> is there anything you learned writing this book that you wished you knew when you were in government? <laughs> well, I have to say, I've been thinking about this book for a number of decades. So there were aspects that were probably um, in the back of my mind, but I, I would mention a couple of things. This point about the connection of regional security and arms control kind of came out to me more in the process of, of with Charles Evans Hughes. And again, as you know, Phil, in some of the writing I've done about dealing with North Korean nuclear, Iranian nuclear, it sort of drew out that aspect. Um, I suppose another point that is was- You have to come integrate this, these political and these military technical yeah, ideas. Th there, there was a tendency coming out of the Cold War because of the technical nature of nuclear arms control to sort of treat this as a technically sophisticated subject separate from the underlying security area. And a good example that both you and I were involved in, which again, I think most of historians have overlooked was how President Bush 41 used the conventional forces negotiation in Europe as a key step in drawing Europe together, dealing with the Soviet Union and it, while we also focused on the nuclear negotiations, the conventional forces negotiations were really the heart of that political process. One might ask today whether one should consider that in a North Korean context, by the way, as opposed to simply looking at the nuclear sort of issues. And clearly, if you're dealing with Iran and the region, it's that overall security aspect. I, I think a second thing is that <laughs> you always learn from the tactics uh, and the sort of the steps that people use. And there's some fascinating ones in the book. I'll let readers sort of draw them out a little bit about the methods of diplomacy. A third piece, which I guess I recognize, but sort of drew to the front, and Jefferson is a good example of this, is the effectiveness of, of teams. So we often think about electing a president, but it's quite important who that president has. So just to take the Jefferson case, you know, he sends Monroe at a critical point to Paris and, and in part to calm the Westerners who were interested in the Mississippi, Monroe being a politician who was respected by the Westerners. But and Monroe is confronted with this opportunity where he thinks he's trying to buy New Orleans or maybe a little bit of the territory around it. And the next thing you know, he's presented with all of Louisiana. We don't even know the borders of it. 
interestingly enough, and Monroe, to his credit, while being nowhere near as, as purely smart as Madison or Jefferson, he makes the courageous decision that he can't send this back to, to Washington, the timing won't permit it, given with, with Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars. He has to take responsibility on himself. And Monroe was a person who could do that. I'm not sure Jefferson would have done it. And then when he brings back the agreement, of course, Jefferson at first is excited, but then he realizes, whoa, I've had this view about constitutional authority that should be limited. There's no authority to buy this. What should I do? Should I ask for a constitutional amendment? And Madison says, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. <laughs> and so uh, I draw the contrast, actually, without going through all the detail with, with LBJ and his advisors and how I think his advice, you know, obviously he bore the responsibility, but how his advisors let him down. So I think from a historical point of view or even a political choice point of view, it's important to think about the team the president yeah. brings. So I want to combine the next two questions. Um, one was, uh, it comes back to the question I asked that you answered about the five themes. And this person, one questioner wanted to know, why did you settle on five? Why not four, six, or some other number? Why, you know, like, uh, but then there's another, another questioner one to, was puzzled over, how would you say Biden's foreign policy? so far um, is inspired by or is drawing on these five traditions. So first of all, uh, what, what, what dartboard did you use to pick, <laughs> to pick five? But then also it's like, how do, you, uh, um, how do you size up the way the Biden administration is trying to uh, draw on those traditions? Well, that's a wonderful question. And, and probably like anyone who's researched or tried to write about a subject, I had many more. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I had to get it to a sort of a manageable level. Uh, so just like, and I had some stories, by the way, I wanted to deal with the negotiations after the Mexican war, because it was a wonderful case of a negotiator being recalled and doing a deal anyway, and the president Polk being confronted with it. So some, some are on the cutting room floor, maybe for volume two. Uh, now, as for the- so When we do the, uh, the full DVD for sale at home, <laughs> and we go to the deleted scenes, Right. That um, we're going to find the whole Mexican war diplomacy. Okay. So the, the Biden administration question is a very good one. Um, and I'd start with this point, which is, I think, one of the challenges, first off, people need to recognize that President Biden and his chief of staff and his political team will feel that their success depends on how they deal with COVID, the pandemic and the economy. And so I, I draw an analogy there when my former boss Baker was chief of staff to Reagan in 81, and he said, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. And then of course, Biden has a very full legislative agenda, which we see every day, and that limits the time he has. So the natural extension of his policy is to what we would call transnational issues. So what's he gonna do with the pandemic abroad? What's he gonna do with immigration uh, abroad? What's he going to do with climate change abroad? What's he going to do with the international economy abroad? I think we're going to find a tension there with what is also renewed in popularity, which is great power politics. How does this fit back into to China? Now, to use my five traditions, you know, I'd start out with, I think, uh, the immigration issues coming from, from Mexico and Central America are going to be very important for his politics. Um, and I think they're struggling because on the one hand, they're trying to tell people don't come. On the other hand, they're trying to look more humanitarian. So th this is an excellent example of the importance of North American policy. Um, in terms of trade, it's the one- but Let's just follow up on that for a second. They don't really seem to be engaging Mexico. Well, I think they've started, first off, one has to appreciate the challenge they have with President right. Lopez Obrador. Um, but I think they've, they've tried to engage Mexico in a limited way dealing with the immigration issue. I think for the, if I were doing this for the long term, I would also be concerned about the institutional development of Mexico. So going back to NAFTA, you know, NAFTA was much more than a trade agreement. NAFTA was a recognition that the old PRI system of Mexico, the corporate state was breaking down. And we we're trying to interconnect the pieces with the North American model. That actually worked pretty well for some of the economic agencies, the finance ministry, the central bank, a lot of the economic 
It didn't work as well on the social side. So more particularly, the USMCA, which is the renegotiated NAFTA, has some labor provisions. They're quite extensive. They could be used to help build Mexican labor unions, or they could be used as a new form of protectionism. So this is where the devil will be in the details of the implementation. Um, but it, then the second case on trade, it's interesting. If you see multilateralism for the administration, uh, you can see it in pandemic, climate, uh, sort of trying to deal with immigration. They're, they're a little slow on trade. <laughs> and I think that's because of the domestic political challenge they face with their coalition. I think they're gonna be pressed on this because you're gonna see that if we're not more active on trade in say East Asia, you're gonna have a hard time competing with China or frankly, new topics like digital trade. So I would not be surprised to see you'll get more attention of this in the trade and technology space over the next uh, year or two. Um, the third one, alliances, that's the heart of what sort of Biden talks about. But then the question is how will we reformulate those for different circumstances? The public support, and uh, I think, is always in the back of his mind. They're going to face midterm elections here with the question of the Congress. They're trying to race to get a lot done. But I think there's a bigger question, which is how do you reformulate public support for this, this, this changed agenda? So I serve on the board of the Carnegie Endowment. When Jake Sullivan was there, he came up with the idea of a foreign policy for the middle class appealing term. What will it mean in fact? <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, and then in terms of the America's purpose, you can see this is sort of a natural aspect of Biden. He wants America to stand for more. Um, but at the same time, you know, how far is he willing to extend resources and power? Obviously, Afghanistan, well, he's had enough. He's coming home. They're trying to work out something in the Iraq context. Like you, Phil, you've written about this. I think the big issue will be not only alliances, but the future of free societies and how those future of free societies will compete with China. Those are the big issues that I think historians will judge them on. Well, we've, uh, we've reached the top of the hour and uh, it's been a, a fascinating conversation, both about history and uh, quite rich in exploring some of the themes in American foreign policy in a way that I think is uh, um, fresh and original and very relevant to, to uh, the 2020s. So I'm gonna turn it back over to our host and um, let you offer some concluding words to our viewers. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great moderating, Phil. And, and, and Bob, you know, it wasn't at all surprising to hear you say you'd been mulling over the themes of this book for decades because it certainly shows in its uh, thoughtfulness, its sweep and its usefulness as a framework for understanding American foreign policy. Um, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of America in the World. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. <laughs>